All right, so, so then the question is, so what, you know, what, what am I getting to? So why can a baby go to heaven even though they're still a sinner? Well, let me explain. Uh, and let's go to Deuteronomy. And we'll see this principle here. And, and Kevin alluded to it in his sermon. But remember we read about in, 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 in the Old Testament, you know, where the children of Israel, they came out of Egypt. And remember, they spied the land, the, the, the 12, I believe it was the 10 spies went in. Um, and eight of them came back saying, oh, you know, these people are too big for us. We're like grasshoppers in their eyes. But remember, Caleb and Joshua said, no, no, we can, we can go in. The Lord is with us. We can take this land. If, why, would the God, why would God promise it to us and not deliver them into our hand? But because the people, the, the eight spies came back and, and struck fear into the people, remember the people complained and they believed the eight spies over, over Caleb and Joshua. And because of that, God did not let them go into the promised land. And we, and we learn in Hebrews that they did not go in because of unbelief. So just that's the context of the passage. And I just wanted to bring you here because there's, there's an interesting uh, point here made in Deuteronomy where the people now have wandered through the wilderness for 40 years and that generation did die and now they're going in and, and, and Moses is giving the law the second time to the people that have gone through the wilderness and have survived that culling in a sense and now are about to enter into the promised land and cross over the river Jordan. Moses says here in verse 34, And the Lord heard the voice of your words. So that this is talking about the, the Israel and the people before that murmured. And was wroth, was angry, and swear, saying, Surely there shall not one of these men of this evil generation see that good land, which I swear to give unto your fathers. Save Caleb, the son of Jephani, he shall see it, and to him will I give the land that he had trodden upon, and to his children, because he hath wholly followed the Lord. Also the Lord was angry with me for your sake, saying, Thou also shalt not go in thither. So he was angry. Remember, Moses struck the rock, so he wasn't allowed to go in either. But Joshua, the son of Nun, which standeth before thee, he shall go in thither. Encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. Now look here in verse 39. Moreover, your little ones, which ye said should be a prey, and your children, which in that day had no knowledge between good and evil, they shall go in thither, and unto them will I give it, and they shall possess it. Now, when I read this verse, this gave me a bit of insight why a baby goes to heaven, why a baby can go to heaven, and why an adult that is a sinner and doesn't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ cannot. Um, it gives us a bit of insight because it says here in verse 39, Moreover, your little ones, which he said should be a prey, and your children, which in that day had no knowledge between good and evil. So the reason why a baby can go to heaven when they die is because they have no knowledge. And we're given, and let's go to Romans 7, because I believe Romans 7 actually explains to us the, the logic behind why this is the case. Why not having this knowledge um, allows a baby to be not accountable for their sins. Let's read here uh, in Romans 7. We'll just read from verse 7. So it says here, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Why is he saying that? Because it says here for earlier on, I'll just show you here, it says that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. So it's talking about this law having dominion over him. But he's saying, is, is there something wrong with the law having dominion over you? Is it something wrong? Is the law sinful? So he continues on in verse 7 and he says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? He says, God forbid. He's like, no, there's nothing wrong with the law. Nothing wrong with the law of God. Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, so no, I had not known sin, but by the law. So he's saying here, the law is not sin, but the reason why I know I'm a sinner is because of God's law. Because God's law says, don't do it, that's how I know what sin is. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. So, so we don't know lust is a sin, that lust is wrong, unless God says it's wrong. And that's the only reason why anything is, is wrong, because God said it. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. And I think that's the key there. So he's saying here, when he, when he didn't have the commandment of God, well, he's saying, well, sin, he says the reason why sin wrought in him this concupiscence is because of the commandment. 
because without the commandment, the sin was dead. And I think that's the key there, and I'll just come back to that in a second. Verse 9. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. So there's that, you know, the, the law is not sinful. There's nothing wrong with the law. It's, it's holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? So he's saying, is, is it the law that was good? Is that what killed me? God forbid. No, it's not the law that kills me, but sin that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. So what is Paul explain, explaining here? It's saying here that the reason why sin kills him is because of the law. And he didn't know that it was sin until he knew the law. So how do we tie that in with Deuteronomy 1 and why babies go to, go to heaven when they die? Well, it's because they are born sinners. They sin. They, yes, they have that sin nature, but because they have no knowledge of good and evil, we read in Deuteronomy 1, they have no knowledge of the law. The sin that they have is dead. And this is what Paul is explaining to us in Romans 7, that even though we have that sin in us from birth, it's dead. And it's not until the point where we understand the law that we know the difference between good and evil, that that sin then revives and then our soul dies. So one of the wrong things about original sin is it teaches that we are born spiritually dead. No, no, we are born spiritually alive because how can God kill us spiritually if we're not guilty of sin? And if, if we're born spiritually dead, that means we deserve hell. Then how can a baby be pardoned from hell without believing on the Lord Jesus Christ? And the way is because even though they are a sinner, the sin that they have is dead because they have no knowledge between good and evil. They have no knowledge of the law. Then when they get that knowledge, and you know who knows what that age is, but once they get that knowledge and they understand now that they are breaking the law and they need a savior, the sin in them is now taking occasion by the commandment. It revives, then their soul dies, and now they are accountable for their sin and they need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, sometimes people resist this doctrine because they say, how can a person, if they're a sinner, be born spiritually alive? And I think I've just explained to you why, because they're not held accountable for their sin because their sin is dead in them. It's not made alive. And, and we see here in verse 9, For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And I think that verse proves that Paul is saying here, I was spiritually alive when I was born. I was spiritually alive before the law. Then when the law came, I spiritually died. Some people say that this verse is saying, well, Paul was just alive physically. And, you know, he was alive physically and then he learned about the law. And then he's talking about dying spiritually. Well, to me, that doesn't make sense because number one, it's in the same verse. So how do you jump all of a sudden from being you know, physically alive? And then when he says sin revived and I died, it's talking about a physical death. That doesn't make sense. And second of all, Paul didn't die when the commandment came. When he says the commandment came, sin revived, and I died, he didn't die physically. So what does he mean? It's because he died spiritually. His soul died. And that's why I believe in verse 9 when he says, I was alive without the law. He's saying he was spiritually alive at one point. So we're not born spiritually dead. We're born spiritually alive. Then when we get the knowledge of the law, the sin revives and then it kills us. I just wanted to make a quick point here about the sin being dead. And I just wanted to tie this into a totally unrelated topic. But I just, I just wanted to mention this to you. That when something is dead, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And the reason why I'm saying this is because how often will people say to you, faith without works is dead. And you're not saved because you don't have faith. No, you have faith. And if you have faith on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're saved. But your faith is dead. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. If it doesn't have works, the faith is dead. It doesn't mean you're not saved. And I just wanted to point this out because it says here that the, that the, that the sin is dead. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. What does it mean? If we go a bit further up in the chapter, we read here in verse 4, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, 
that we should bring forth fruit unto God. So verse 4 is saying we are saved in order to bring forth fruit unto God. And I just want you to see what it's contrasted here in the next couple of verses. In verse 5, For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law that being dead, wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So what are the two comparisons here? There's the walking in the spirit. We're saved to walk in the spirit and bring forth fruit unto God, which is like life. Or we walk in our flesh and we bring forth fruit unto death. So the reason why I think the Bible describes sin as being dead is because it's not bringing forth fruit. See, because if your faith is alive, you bring forth fruit unto God. When, sin is al when the sin is alive, it brings forth fruit unto death and kills you, right? But when the sin is dead, it's not bringing forth that fruit. So without the knowledge of the law, the knowledge of the commandments, the sin is dead. That's why it's not killing the baby spiritually yet. It's not killing that person because it hasn't brought forth that fruit unto death. Does that make sense? So when something is dead, it doesn't bring forth fruit. It's not profitable. And that's how we understand James 2. Because James 2 is about your faith being profitable to another man. And that's why it says, What doth it profit, my brethren? Though man say he hath faith and hath not works, can faith save him? Yes, faith can save him, but is it profitable to another person? No. So it's here, it doesn't bring forth this fruit unto God. Your faith doesn't have this life that Romans is talking about. Um, it, it doesn't bring forth the fruit of the Spirit. Um, and I just wanted to show you this other verse um, in Romans 4 that shows that dead does not necessarily mean non-existent. Um, it, it's this idea of bringing forth fruit. <clears throat> uh, the Bible says here, where are they? Oh, yeah. I'll just read from verse 17, talking about Abraham here. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations. This is talking about Abraham. According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And verse 19 is the one I just want us to focus on. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. See, so he calls Abraham's body dead. Did his body not exist? No, it existed. It just was dead. When he was about 100 years old, and look at this, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. So this idea of dead is that, in this, in this sense, because obviously dead can mean a lot of things, but in this sense it can also mean that it doesn't bring forth fruit. Um, and that's how I think we can understand James. You know, it's not bringing forth fruit and being profitable to somebody else. And how we also understand sin. Because when sin is dead, it doesn't bring forth fruit unto death and doesn't kill you spiritually. And that is why a baby goes to heaven when they die. So it's not because God just pardons them for no reason. It's not because they're born sinless. They are born a sinner, but because without the knowledge of the law, the sin is dead. It hasn't killed them spiritually. When they do understand the Lord, then they die spiritually. And now they have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the age in this sermon. Um, we'll discuss that in the next sermon. Okay, so the last passage I want to go to is Galatians. Galatians 3. 16. Because I think we actually see this same principle... Um, we, we see this same principle in um, Galatians 3 of the purpose of the law and the law coming to, to reveal sin and, and, to, and to condemn us, not to undo the covenant. Um, and I just thought it was interesting because it was kind of related to Romans 7. It says here in verse 16, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So I'll just mention there, you know, my position on the Jews is I don't believe the Jews are God's chosen people. Um, the question is really, who are the real Jews? And I think Galatians 3 is very clear that the promise of Abraham and to his seed was to Jesus Christ, not to seeds. So it says there, um, he saith and not to seeds as of many. So the promise of Abraham was not to his physical descendants, but as of one and to thy seed, which is Christ. 
And this I say that the covenant which was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. So what is it saying here? It's saying here that the, the, the law, the Old Testament covenant, came 430 years after Abraham. Because remember, the law came by Moses. Abraham was 430 years before. So 430 years before, God is promising Abraham, you know, in your seed shall, you know, uh, you'll, you'll be blessed. Um, the promise to the seed. So he's saying here, well, the, the covenant that came 430 years later of the law doesn't make the promise to Abraham of none effect, right? Verse 18, For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. So he's saying what he promised to Abraham um, was by promise and not of the law. So the law is not going to make the um, promise of none effect. And the verse I just wanted to point out here is verse 19 in this passage. Because listen to this. Wherefore then serveth the law? So the question is saying, well, why then did God give the law? If Abraham already knew he was going to be saved by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there have been a law which could have been given, which if there have been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith is come, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster, for ye are all the children of God by faith in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. So I think that is um, uh, very clear that it's those of us that believe on Jesus Christ are the ones that inherit the promises of Abraham and not his physical descendants. Um, but I just wanted to point out a couple of things here that were just similar to Romans 7. Remember how it says in Romans 7, I had not known um, sin. Well, I can't remember the exact same, but he said, I didn't know sin, but by the law. And it's just interesting here that in verse 19 that it says, why was the Lord given? It was given because of transgression. So that same principle of the reason why God gave the law, it wasn't given to them, what a lot of people think, to keep the law in order to be saved. No, people in the Old Testament were not, not saved by the law. You know, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Salvation by grace is all through the Bible. So the, the Old Testament law was not given in order for them to keep and to be saved. Because, you know, uh, Paul is saying here in Galatians that if there was a law given where righteousness could be obtained, then we wouldn't have righteousness by faith. We would have righteousness by the law. But the law was not given in order to keep and for us to be saved. The law was given to show how sinful we were. Because the promise was always there by faith. The law was added 430 years later because of transgression to show you that you're a sinner. And that's why uh, the law is given. I just think that's interesting. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to say here is, you see here in verse 24, where there's that principle again, where it says, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Again, see the law teaching us that we're sinners, teaching us that we're sinners, that we need a savior, that we need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the purpose of the law. So when the Bible says here, but after that faith is come, sorry, did I just skip that out? Verse 25, it says, But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Uh, where does it say? Oh, am I missing? It says we are no longer under the law. Or did I miss that verse? Let's bring us to Christ. Yeah, maybe I'm thinking of another verse. I was just thinking that, you know, when, when people say we're no, long, no longer under the law, we're under grace. Uh, verse 25, yeah, thanks. So it goes, But after that faith is come, oh, it says we're no longer under a schoolmaster. So I guess the thought I was having, maybe I was thinking of the other verse when I wrote verse 25 in my notes where it says we're no longer under law, we're under grace. 
It doesn't mean that therefore the law no longer applies in the sense of, yes, it's still our moral compass. It still tells us what is morally right and morally wrong. It, when it says we're no longer under the law, it means we are not under the law in, t in terms of how we are justified. You know, we were never justified by the law. We're not under the law in order to be saved. We are under grace, meaning we have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. And just one last point, one last point. I thought that was the last verse I was going to go to, but I just want to show you this. Romans 2, verse 14. So I hope that gives you a good understanding of why babies go to heaven. It sort of went in depth, but you know, basically the conclusion is because they don't understand the law, their sin is dead, they haven't died spiritually. So the last question I just want to finish on is people then would ask the question, well then, when we preach the gospel to somebody, when we preach the law of God to somebody, are we condemning them by now they, they're not ignorant? You know, people, I've seen this meme on Facebook where it's like a picture of an Eskimo or something like that. And it'll say like, if I would have gone to heaven in ignorance and, and gone to heaven anyway because I didn't know the law, did you just condemn me by telling me about it? Uh, no. Because, you know, the reason why I don't think that's the case for adults is because the Bible says here in Romans 2, 14 and 15, it says, For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things which are contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. So it's not that when you preach the gospel to somebody, now you're condemning them, and if you didn't preach to them, they would have gone to heaven anyway. No, because the law of God is written on their heart, their conscience bears witness, so that's how they come to the knowledge of the law, because it's already built into them. Then when they know, they know they're a sinner, they know they need a saviour, that they cannot justify themselves. So it only applies to babies, because they do not have this knowledge, they do not have the knowledge and the conscience, I don't know if it's not bearing witness, or they don't understand it yet. But I also think that this principle can be applied to disabled people. You know, because people often are mentally disabled or they, they're born where they always have the mentality of a child. And um, so I, I think it can apply to mentally disabled people as well. And that's why I think if somebody does not have the capacity to understand the law, does not have the capacity to understand the gospel, I believe when they die, they will go to heaven. Um, and the reason why I'm just preaching this today is so you have the right understanding of why they go to heaven. Because if you understand it a different way, I think it's actually false doctrine, meaning people are either sinless or they're born guilty of sin and somehow God pardons them without any justice.